Well, good morning. Welcome to our service this morning, and a warm welcome if you're visiting with us today too. It's lovely to have you. We have tea and coffee through in the hall after the service, and there's also a crash during the service today. There's no holiday Sunday school yet, but that will resume in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, just one or two items. The bulletin's rough, uh, roughly the same. Uh, just a wee note about this sermon series that we're doing in the mornings through the summer. Summer songs. Today we're uh, looking at Psalm 32. Um, we have adopted a camp, as you'll know, which is as Westfield Junior. Uh, so Rod and Emma and Kenny Hugh are away down at that camp. So I've safely arrived in as Westfield. And uh, we'll be there for this whole week, so we continue to remember them in our prayers. Uh, and also just a reminder, there's just a few uh, newsletters left at the door, so feel free to uh, pick one up. If you haven't had one, if you've been away on holiday, uh, there's just a few important matters, uh, especially the decoupling proposal of Tain and Fern Free Church. So we ask you to pray about over the summer. Well, let's uh, worship God. We're going to sing together in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 in the Sing Psalms. A psalm that speaks of the great contrast between the Christian and the non-Christian. And especially uh, pay attention today to the word and the condition of the believer who is blessed. That's what we're going to look at in our summer song today too. So Psalm 1 on page 1. Blessed is the one who turns away from where the wicked walk, who does not stand in sinners' paths or sit with those who mock. If you're able, we'll stand and sing to God's praise. together. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, today we are found in the house of God and with your people. Uh, We pray that as we draw near to you, as we sing 
and read from your word, and as we hear it being preached, Lord, that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would minister to us and bless your word to us. We thank you for what we've even began singing about the condition of the Christian is somebody who is blessed. And an amazingly deep word that speaks of wonderful consequences for the one whom you have saved. The blessed individual is fully satisfied, not just in temporal things like money and health, but fully satisfied because they are in relationship with God. They are, as we were singing, righteous. They have a right standing before you. And we pray, thanking you and praising you that many people in this room today are blessed. They can call themselves that. They may not feel it in and of themselves, and yet it is no less true that they are your people, that they are indeed the happy ones. They have been set apart, and they have uh, all contentment in and through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we want to praise you and worship you on this day, the first day of the week, Uh, As we uh, think of all that has happened in the week past, uh, the joys, the encouragements, the fun things we've done, also uh, the hard, challenging and routine matters of life. But Lord, we look ahead now to uh, Lord willing days in this week and as many continue on their summer holidays, uh, we thank you for the children who are here. And so we thank you for those who have come back, having been away from us. And we just rejoice to see them again and pray even for uh, the short time we have to speak with them now that you would uh, minister into their hearts, that the seed of the gospel would continue to take root and flourish and blossom day by day and week by week. So continue with us. Forgive us for our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to come down to the front, so if the young ones, any of the young ones want to come, uh, we'll come down to the seats here. You push it. Okay, girls, just come have a seat anywhere. Good. Nice to have you. Okay, guys, good to see you again. Last week was missing... Thank all of you, so it's lovely to see you again and be able to come and uh, speak to you. Even though it's the summer holidays, uh, I think I'm definitely still learning stuff, and I think you are probably still learning things. If you've been away, maybe you're exploring different places, maybe some of you have been on planes or trains or driving far in your cars, Um, but I've learned something. I was away at a camp a couple of weeks ago, and even at that camp, I definitely learned something new, and I want to share it with you today, and actually, everybody who's here today can use this, because even I've been using it this week uh, in my own house, and anywhere I've gone, actually, I've been using this. So, first of all, a question to see if you can try and work out uh, what this is. So, if I'm baking a cake, which doesn't happen very often, But if I was, and if you were, and you saw on the recipe that you needed to use one TSP of vanilla, what instrument do I need to get? What item? Well done. So TSP is a teaspoon. So I brought a teaspoon uh, with me. It's a wee bit bigger. It looks like a bigger one, but it's got a normal teaspoon size on it. And it's a teaspoon that I want to teach you about and tell you about today, because this is called the teaspoon prayer. So we remember T-S-P, the teaspoon prayer. So the first letter of T means thank you. So when we pray and we're talking to God, the first thing we want to do is thank God. We thank God for who he is, for what he's done, and what he is doing. So we thank God that he is holy, that he loves us uh, for 
that he is perfect. Thank God for who he is. We thank God for what he's done, that he's sent Jesus into this world to save every one of us who will believe in him. And we thank God for what he is doing and that he has given us the Bible. We thank him for our families and we thank him for the homes that we are a part of. So girls, we're just learning about the teaspoon prayer. So there's a teaspoon. T-S-P, like you would see in our recipe. So the first letter is T, which is for thank you. We thank God. The second letter is S, so it means sorry. So we want to say sorry to God. For anybody here who is a Christian, they've said sorry to God. Why would you think they would say sorry to God? Carly? Absolutely, we've all done wrong things. So we call that, what's the little word that we, let's recall that? Yes, sin, absolutely. So we want to, everybody's a Christian has ultimately said sorry to God for all the sin they have committed and would ever. And Jesus is willing to take away all of the, our sin through what he did for us on the cross. But every day, all of us need to keep saying sorry to God for all the wrong things that we do. Perhaps, maybe you disobey your parents, maybe not, or you put up a fight to come to church or to go to school or to read your Bibles. We need to say sorry to God for when we're disobedient or when we're rude or get angry. We need to say sorry to the people, but especially say sorry to God. So what was tea in the teaspoon prayer? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And what was S, Fraser? Sorry. Sorry. So thank you, sorry, and P is please. So we need to be really careful that we don't always just skip out thank you and sorry and rush to please because please is like what you want to ask God for in your prayers. But God does ask us to come and, and ask him for different things in our lives. He, maybe we want to ask him for help in school. Please help me in school. Please help me for strength today. The ability to focus in church. You know, there's no Sunday school, so ask, pray that God would help you to focus in church today. And just praying that we would be nicer to our siblings or our parents. Just we pray to God, asking him uh, and he invites us to do that as well. So thank you, sorry, please. This is the teaspoon prayer. And today we're going to look at a psalm, one of the summer songs that we're looking at. And in that psalm it says, Let everyone pray to God while he may be found. As you and everybody in here should pray the teaspoon prayer while he may be found. Thank you, sorry, and please. Thank you guys for listening. We're going to uh, pray the Lord's Prayer uh, together just now. So let's clasp our hands and close our eyes and the whole congregation will pray together with us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to uh, keep singing, this time in Psalm 51, in the Scottish Psalter, Psalm 51, it's on page 280. We'll sing from verse 1 to 7, After thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me, for thy compassion's great blot out all mine iniquity. Psalm 51, uh, from verse 1 to 7, and if you're able... We can stand to sing. Yeah. 
extended going out to Crash can make their way through. And we're going to turn our Bibles to uh, the Old Testament, to Psalm 32, as we continue in this uh, series of summer songs. So we looked at uh, Psalm 100 last week, a psalm of thanksgiving and praise. And we come today to Psalm 32. Uh, we just sang Psalm 51, uh, and it, as I'll say in a, a short while, uh, these two psalms seem to be linked, Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. And uh, one commentator put it as, at Psalm 51, just as we were singing, and you can even get from the tune that David used really appropriately, Psalm 51 is as David, the, the psalm writer, he sings with a broken heart. But Psalm 32, he sings with a blessed heart. As he comes to now see that the sin that he has, knows he has committed and confessed before God, he now is reminded that he indeed is blessed because he has come to God and uh, asked for forgiveness. Let's read Psalm 32, the Psalm of David, page 560. Let's hear the word of God. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse and mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked. But the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Amen. This is the word of God. Well, before we sing and turn to this passage, we're going to uh, pray again uh, to the Lord. So let's pray together. Father God, again, we just come uh, and we want to pray as we were teaching with the children to thank you. And as we've seen in this psalm, to say sorry to you. And we are uh, thankful also that you invite us to come with our own requests. To lay our burdens down before you and to come seeking your help. So we do thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you've done and are doing. Lord, we are sorry for our sin. We thank you that you've brought many of us to, uh, to ultimately come in repentance of our sin and plead for your forgiveness. And we pray that today that we would continue, for we know we are wicked we don't just have blotches of sin in our heart, but our hearts are sinful. But only through you and what you have done are we made holy and is our sin forgiven. 
And Lord, our prayer is that everyone in here, and we think of those who are, uh, who are with us, who may watch this later, who are not yet saved, and who still harness the burden of their own sin. Lord, we pray that today you would work in their hearts, as we'll say and as we've read, that all people would pray to you while you may be found, that today is God's day and tomorrow is not guaranteed. And so, Lord, our prayer is that you would open the eyes of the blind, that you would open their ears, and that they would cry out, confessing their sin and embracing their Saviour. And so, Lord, that's what we ask for. Ultimately, we pray for souls to be saved. Those who are here within the walls of your church and those who are scattered throughout our villages who have no concern or desire at all to be here. Or we pray, we long for them to come. For those whom perhaps they've left in their own homes today. We long for them to sit next to them in church. But more than that, for them to come calling out to Jesus to be saved. That's our great pleading and prayer. Or we do uh, come to you and pray more generally as well. Uh, we pray thanking you for uh, Rod and Emma and Kenny Hugh arriving at their camp in Oswestry. We pray for them today as they head to church. And we thank you for the meals that have already been served and will be over this week. Just help them in the kitchen and help them in the work that they'll do there and the busy time that they'll have. But may they be encouraged over this week as well. And we thank you for the main leaders and the other leaders who will assist in the running of that camp with over 30 children uh, and young people, we just pray that they would enjoy their time together, but that they would hear this invitation to come to Jesus. We thank you for all 10 of the camps that some have already finished and others still to begin. And we just pray for the three camps that are happening this week in Kincraig and Renfrew and uh, the two in Oswestry. And so, Lord, we just commit them to you and pray uh, that these camps will be a blessing to our young people. And as they have done in many years gone by, uh, this would be the root and the start of their, them being saved and their journey with Jesus. Or we are encouraged to pray and we want to pray for uh, St. Andrew's Free Church. Uh, we thank you for their minister, for Paul. Uh, we thank you for his work within uh, the Board of Ministry as well. But we thank, give thanks with them for the growth in their congregation over the last 12 months, for the uh, few conversions they've seen, uh, a good number of new members and a new elder. Um, we give thanks for those who have moved on from the church just this summer. We know there are many students uh, within that area. And we pray for uh, with them for a good crop of new people to arrive in the autumn. Ordered, uh, we just are thankful here as well at Tain and Fern for the new elders and deacons uh, who will be ordained in the coming weeks. And we just pray uh, for them and for their families, for the responsibilities uh, and privilege that they will uh, take up here in the congregation and community. And we pray on uh, for what we're uh, proposing as a Kirk session, Lord, help us to be wise and to know what is uh, right and for your will. And as we pray about the decoupling of this congregation, uh, we thank you for uh, all that has happened in the 14 years since we were brought together and how you have uh, encouraged both ends of both Tain and Fern. So, Lord, we just ask that you would bless your word to us today as we open it, as we study it together. Uh, may we indeed be a blessed people. May we know that we are, if we are indeed the children of God. Forgive us, go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, sing on in Psalm 6. In the Sing Psalm, Psalm 6.
There's a groupings of uh, psalms that are uh, based on repentance, saying sorry to God, to put it simply. And Psalm 6 is the first of these. Psalm 32, as we're going to study, is the next. It includes um, several other psalms, like 130, that we love to sing so often. They're psalms of repentance, coming to God, saying sorry, seeking His forgiveness for the wrong things that we've done, the sin we have committed. So we're going to sing Psalm 6. Lord, in your wrath rebuke me not. In anger do not chasten me. Have mercy, Lord, for I am faint. Lord, heal me in my agony. Let's stand and sing to God's praise. Lord, in your wrath rebuke me not. In anger do not chasten me. Have mercy, Lord, for I am faint. Lord, heal me in my agony. My soul with anguish is distressed. Oh, God's help. We're going to turn then back to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. And you may or may not have heard of the name of Fanny Crosby. Uh, she's probably America's uh, best known hymn writer uh, with over 8,000 worship songs, many of which uh, you'll be familiar with and have sung as well. She lived until she was almost 95 years old, but when she was just six weeks old, she was uh, rendered completely blind. Uh, the doctor applied a substance to her eyes that blinded her for the rest of her life. However, that setback uh, to her didn't stop her, and from a young age, by God's grace, she came to know the Lord and began to write hymns to the Lord. Fast forward into 1873, when she was 53, she was visiting a lady who was a musician, and the woman played a tune which she had recently written herself, and she asked Fanny Crosby, what words would you put to this tune? And she went on to to sing to her one of her own hymns. I'm sure you've heard it before or you can go and look it up later on today. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. 
born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising the Savior all the day long. The words of that hymn, they apply to the much earlier words written by David in our psalm today, Psalm 32. David is really saying in this psalm, this is my story. This is my song. So let's consider David's story and what is or could be your story too. And we do that under two headings, the condition and the confession. So first of all, we think about uh, the condition, the condition. And if you have ever uh, done this, uh, you can do it in any old way. Maybe it's just phoning somebody up when you see an ad in the newspaper, or maybe nowadays you see something on eBay and you sh- you're wanting to buy this item off eBay. You should take notice of what condition the item is in. From buying a new car to a piece of clothing, the condition of the product is important as to whether or not you want it and how much you're going to be willing to pay for this item. And the condition that David shares with us in verses 1 and 2 cost him nothing, but it cost God dearly. Sometimes those items online will say that it's in used or it's good or like new condition. But as David now speaks about the Christian, even about himself, he states that his and you, Christian, your condition is blessed. Your condition, you are blessed. Of all of the words that David could have used, This is what he chose. You are blessed. It doesn't just say that you're thankful or you're relieved or you've been saved. These things are all true. He says that every Christian, both today and for the rest of your life and forever, are blessed. To put it very simply, the meaning of the word blessed is to be happy. But we can go deeper than that. Because it's true of those who are blessed have been set apart. You are, have been, are being and will be made holy. But we can go even deeper than that. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today... If you are blessed, it means you are divinely favoured. That God looks on you with favour. That you are fully satisfied. Satisfied not because you have all the money that you need. Or because your health is in tip-top condition. You are satisfied Because you are now in a relationship with God. Because your sin has been forgiven. And that's what David sings about here. That's why he's singing with his blessed heart in Psalm 32. In contrast to his broken heart of Psalm 51. And here we, as we uh, look a bit deeper at at verses 1 and 2. You'll see here, if you've got your Pew Bible, the NIV Bible, our, our version here doesn't make the distinction, uh, but there is, in fact, three different words used here for what separated us, separated us from God, from being blessed. So you have two different words, and the same word used twice. But the three different words here, transgression, sin, and iniquity. So transgression, uh, we see there that um, in verse 1, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. Transgression is the idea of crossing over a line or defying authority, 
And then we have the word sin twice. Sin is the general term that we use, as even uh, young ones were sharing with us today. It's the wrong things that we do. We've all done wrong things. And that's what it is. It means missing the mark, falling short. But the other word that's used here is iniquity. And it speaks of twisting away, moving away from the right way. And uh, as he often did, if you've ever heard many of Charles Spurgeon's sermons or read them, he described these as the three-headed dog at the gates of hell. Transgression, sin, and iniquity. He described it as the three-headed dog at the gates of hell. We really have no idea. I could speak for myself, but... I think I speak for us all. We really have no idea of how sinful we are. How stained our hearts are in God's sight. We like to believe that there are maybe just a couple of blemishes there. But certainly not as bad as some other people we know. However, the truth is that Your heart is tarred in sin. David says, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count. And that word for man here, it's the word Adam. And it brings us all the way back to Adam in the Garden of Eden, all the way back in Genesis. And he sinned. He took the fruit He broke the relationship that humanity, that he had with God. And what was the result? That every single one of us born into this world has inherited sin. See, we're not born with a pure heart and only add a few specks of misbehavior into it. No, we start with a black heart And just pile on more and more blotches of sin. We need to see this. Our black sinful hearts. Before we'll ever see Jesus. Unless we can admit that we not only sin. But are sinners. Then we will never be forgiven or blessed. David's blessed assurance comes from knowing the sin he has committed has been forgiven. But how? How has it been forgiven? And is it possible in your case for your sin to be forgiven too? The barking three-headed dog at the gates of hell has been silenced by Jesus. And can be silenced for you too. There were three different terms for sin. But now you see in that same two verses. There are three different ways. That sin is dealt with for David. And dealt with for the Christian. That your sin. Your transgression. Your sin and your iniquity. Is now forgiven. Covered and not counted against you. You see this is the point. This is the wonderful. Just small details. Which have great consequences. That here all your sin is taken away. All of it. Not just the sins you think, well, everybody does these things wrong. But all the sin, the most vile thing you have ever done in your life. That tarred heart that you were born with. Take that sin taken off it. And so here we see your sin is forgiven, covered, and not counted against you. First of all, it's forgiven. At the communion here in Hilton just a few weeks ago, uh, words struck me, which I've heard uh, many, many times before in my life, and probably even preached on, uh, but Ian McCritchie, our visiting preacher, he just mentioned in the passing, those who are forgiven much, love much. Those who are forgiven little, love little. And he went on to say so so simply, every Christian has been forgiven much. 
every Christian, not just the ones with dramatic conversions and you who can't even remember a time you weren't a Christian, all of us have been forgiven much. Whether you were converted young and, so to speak, didn't rebel too much as we, you hear in testimonies of other people in ways that they did. You may not, or to the other extent, you may not have committed crimes or murder. Like, and so you think, well, the forgiveness that is needed for the pile of your sin isn't as much as is needed for somebody else. But now, as we've said, every heart is full of sin. Whether you were saved and became a Christian as a child or just a year ago or in your latter years of your life, it still cost God to send his son Jesus into the world to die on the cross to save you from your sin. It took God to send his son into the world for all Christians to be saved, to be forgiven. The second term is our sin being covered. Uh, with the good weather that we had a little bit earlier in the year, towards the end of the spring, uh, we invested in some uh, garden seating. Uh, thinking about all the sunny and summer days that we would sit outside. But as you know, too often uh, the summer hasn't been uh, like that. It's very often been spoiled by rain and thunderstorms yesterday. But thankfully our seating came with a cover. But if I forget to put the cover onto it before uh, the weather changes, then the cushions are totally exposed to all of the elements. But when I do remember, the seating is protected and it is shielded from the weather. Without God's covering, we are totally exposed in our sin. Not just to get in a little wet, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood became the covering for our sin. Nothing and nobody can ever undo the work he has accomplished. Nothing and nobody can, can hurt us because our sin has been removed from God's sight. And just think about that. What a covering it must be which hides our sin away from the all-seeing God. And the third way is, uh, the third way that we see here is that uh, our sin is not counted against us. While we can rejoice that our sin is not counted against us, we must never forget that our sin has been counted against us. Jesus. I was speaking to a man uh, this week who was uh, sharing with me and a few others how he feels as a Christian. And he described it like being set free from death row. As someone else has taken his place for him. I know he's right to think like that because Paul the Apostle uses these two verses of Psalm 32 in the New Testament in his letter to Romans in chapter 4 saying, we deserve the death penalty. That's what our sin has earned us. But God has freely and lovingly desired to forgive, cover, and not count your sin against you. So are you blessed? Have you been forgiven? This is the condition of the Christian. They are blessed. They are happy. They are holy. But they are fully satisfied. Because they are in a relationship with God. But we come secondly to think about the confession. Uh, the confession. And we see this in particular from verse 3 to 5. 
I uh, love to read or listen to uh, autobiographies. I think all of us have a fascination to hear how other people have lived their lives, uh, what has happened in their lives, the ups and downs, the lessons they've learned. Uh, Usually here on a communion weekend, we have the visiting preacher share their testimony. Uh, This is the story of how God has and is working in their lives. From verses 3 to 5, David now shares his experience. This is his story. This is his song. He's thinking back to when he tried to run and hide from God with all the sin that he had committed. And the psalm seems to be, as we've said already, a sequel to Psalm 51. In that song, David speaks about his specific sin of adultery with Bathsheba, and then as he went on to have her husband Uriah murdered. Adultery and murder. And he had tried to escape the shame and the guilt and the consequences of the sin he has committed. He didn't talk about it, He tried not to think about it, yet the stress of his double life only left him feeling older, depressed, and weak. In Psalm 51, David sang, as we've said, with that broken heart. He he speaks here about even the fact he feels like he aged while he hid his sin from God. And undoubtedly some of us are in David's shoes today. You may be trying to bury and have been maybe for a long time some incident that happened in your life and yet it often appears in your minds over and over again. We may think if we just do good, come to church, then God won't hold it against us. But listen to what David said. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. See, he was resolute to withhold this information from God, not to to share it, not to confess it. He wasn't wanting to break his commitment to his silence, even though it was breaking his body in the process. What a killer sin is. And we've all experienced that. Some unconfessed sin for a time. Or even just the sheer fact that uh, we are sinners. The spiritual problem, it begins to hamper our physical condition. But then we see uh, the second thing. That he's depressed or he's oppressed here in verse 4. For day and night... God, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Now, we did have some good days at the beginning of summer, at the end of spring, when it was incredibly hot. Uh, Some of you have just been on the continent where it was even hotter. And, And your strength is sapped at the end of the day because you've been exposed to the sun all throughout uh, the day. And when you get to your bed, you try not to complain because you know you wouldn't see the sun like this for another long time. And yet you're sapped of energy. You're exhausted. And that's the illustration that David uses here when David speaks about his own strength being sapped from him. But it's not because he had a wonderful holiday at the poolside No, his strength is sapped for a very different reason because God's hand is oppressing him and pushing him down because God will not let him off the hook with the sin that he has not confessed in his life. And you know, this oppression from God, if you're feeling it today, it's a good thing. Not to remain in that feeling of oppression and depression, and been feeling shattered. But David's weakness and misery were actually a positive thing because it was the Holy Spirit 
convicting him of his sin and his hardness of heart. That was an essential and is an essential mark of those who truly belong to God. So it's not like we take comfort in the fact, oh well, good, I, I haven't told God about this sin, but I'm feeling bad about it, so it's okay. But in fact, as, we're, as we feel that hand of God pushing us down, feeling shattered, it should lead us then, as it did for David, to his confession. I want you to notice uh, something else here. When did this happen in David's life? The sin of, with Bathsheba, the adultery, and then the murder of her husband Uriah. When did it happen in his life? It wasn't in his youth and in his immaturity. It was, we could say, at the height of his ministry, when he was king, when he was years on as a believer and maturing or maturing in the faith. But David's a stark warning to the church, to all of us as Christians, as we go on with Jesus. We don't grow out of sinning. The risk is no less. It's a warning for us. Because we actually become more and more aware of the sin that is in our lives. Persevere. Persevere to the very end. And so we see there uh, these ways in which uh, David is feeling that uh, he's feeling older and oppressed. He's feeling weak. But then we come, thankfully, to verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. He's now found his voice. The loosening of the tongue, the moment of realization, the sin he had tried to cover, him, cover for himself has now been covered by God, as we read in verse 1. And God has provided the covering for the blessed. Don't delay another moment. Don't go on bearing your sin when Jesus has offered to take your sin away. You know, in the next verse, David gives again a stark warning. Certainly, it's an encouragement to the believer in verse 6. Let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. And he goes on to talk about the protection that the believer is able to enjoy with God. There's a stark warning for those who are not blessed, for those of you who are not Christians, for those of you who have not given your life to Jesus. Here's the warning. Let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Think about these words. While you may be found. What's important about that? Well, it's a reminder that there is a time limit to this amazing free grace. While God may be found, while his ear is today open to listening to your confession of your sin, while you have the breath in your lungs, use that God-given breath to confess your sins to the Lord now before he condemns you for your sin on that day of judgment to come. Again, Charles Spurgeon, he preached a sermon entitled, Now. Within it, he urged, and I do too, saying, Tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is the day of salvation. This is God's day. Now is the appointed time. Now is your opportunity to turn and be saved. He said, there are people who procrastinated about Christ and they have procrastinated themselves into a lost eternity. There are people who have delayed responding to Jesus and that delay led them to hell. If you are to be saved, 
You must believe in Christ now while the offer has been presented to you. Back in verse 5, David sings, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me. A light uh, came on in my car just on the dashboard a few uh, weeks ago. And uh, initially I was thinking, well, it'll be fine. The light will just go off by itself. The problem will get fixed by itself. And so I, I left it for a while, but obviously the problem didn't go away. And so I called my garage and I told them about my problem. I need to get the car seen and it needs to be fixed. Uh, the garage heard me and they agreed with me and they said, bring it in in three weeks time. That's not how God operates. When you open your mouth, if you open your mouth today and confess your sins, the response is immediate. There is no time to wait. There is no probation period. God's forgiveness is always ready to be transacted. The work of God to provide forgiveness is done. Jesus has been to the cross. He has paid the price for the sin. But you need to receive it. You need to confess your sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Let me just skip to the very last verse. And there's much more we could have said. Verse 11 says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. I can't finish the sermon. I've shared this story with you before, but I want to share it for the benefit of anyone who's not heard it, but to hear it again as well. Because I can't finish this sermon without sharing one of the most memorable moments in my short ministry so far. Because I, and I know several of you, now attribute Psalm 32 to uh, John Ross, uh, Buzz's brother. Uh, John Ross was an elder in this congregation. And just a couple of years into uh, my time here, uh, he passed into glory. But I was sitting with John in his living room just days before he died. And you never know how anybody may be in these final uh, moments of their life. Uh, but John was an inspiration. Almost as soon as I sat down, uh, he excitedly uh, reached over for his blue Sing Sam's book, which was beside his chair, and he turned it open. He said, Andrew, have you, have you ever heard this one before? And he turned to uh, Psalm 32. And he didn't read it to me, but he sang it. How blessed the one who has received forgiveness for his sins, whose sins are covered from God's face, whose debt is cancelled by God's grace. There's no deceit in him. He did so because he was blessed. He did so because he had confessed his sin. He did so because he knew he was forgiven and he was going to glory with God. Is this your story and your song? Have you confessed your sin? Are you forgiven? Amen. Let's sing uh, these words of Psalm 32. Sing Psalms on page 38. Uh, we'll sing the first seven verses. Let me just read the verse we uh, didn't get to properly. But verse 7. You are my hiding place, O Lord, my true security. You keep me safe in troubled days. You circle me with joyful praise when you have set me free. Let's stand and sing. To God's praise.
May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain with each of you both now and forever. Amen.